Okay, um, let's get started. Yeah, so, you know, I, um, my husband and I wrote most of our books together. And uh, we, it was really in 1996 that we wrote Riddle and Free Kids. And it, we were the first ones pretty much who wrote a book on alternative treatment of hyperactivity and attention deficit disorder. And it was really uh, starting to be an epidemic. We saw kids with these traits beforehand because in our book, even in 1996, we included uh, cases, many cases that we had seen. But it was at that point that it was really skyrocketing. It was the time of uh, support groups for parents which were CHAD, which as it turned out, were connected with um, the pharmaceutical company, but parents were desperate at that time. And uh, I think now it's parents are more familiar with it and uh, more willing to look at alternatives, but there was a certain desperation then. So a lot of these kids are very, what we would call hyperactive. Now, with ADHD, we're talking about attention. So there's attention with hyperactivity. In other words, attention issues with hyperactivity or without. But many of these kids are moving constantly. And uh, so the, the first slide here is actually uh, a, a, the effect of uh, stimulant medication on these children and uh, being that, um, you know, with Ritalin and, and drugs like that, children did experience appetite loss and weight loss and these other symptoms as well. So that's one of the reasons that many of the parents were really excited about looking to us for an alternative. So I think we can go on to the next slide. Yeah. So, uh, and this study, which is from 2012, Riddle and gone, gone Wrong, I think that there is a place for, for uh, stimulant medication in some children, perhaps who don't respond to other less, uh, other, natural, um, other natural approaches. Although most of the kids that we saw and continue to see do quite well on homeopathy. And so you can see here, what I always tell parents is before you put your children on medication for behavioral and learning problems, at least give homeopathy a try. And so you can see in this study on Ritalin, for example, these children who were heavily reliant on medications in the long run had side effects and didn't have a lot of benefits. One thing I can say since we started working with these kids even before 2000, a number of the kids that I treated then, I actually either see them still very infrequently for other issues, or now sometimes I'm seeing their children since it's been a long time. And I can say really uh, beyond the shadow of a doubt that um, uh, more than ever, it's really possible to help these children. There, there, were, there was one family, I started with the mom and I'm sure I've been treating her for over 30 years. I still, now I'm treating her uh, for uh, menopausal, post-menopausal symptoms. And so I treated her kids for hyperactivity and for learning disabilities. And now I'm treating the grandchild. So the grandchild, this is uh, an, an interesting case because in homeopathy, there are over 5,000 possible remedies. And one of the beauties of homeopathy is we individualize treatment. And so this was one, it was, it was a very sweet child. He was uh, very silly, really climbing the walls and driving his parents um, crazy. And so when I talked to him, he was really quite obsessed, believe it or not, with farm animals. Well, not too surprising because, you know, he lived on a farm, but there was one farm animal 
that he was just completely drawn to, fascinated by, and that was actually a donkey. And, uh, and in homeopathy, one of the categories is milk remedies. They're called LAC, the LAC remedies, the most common one being dog's milk, which is not too surprising since so many families have dogs in the family and uh, are best friends. But this particular child needed donkey's milk homeopathically. Now that may seem really strange, but that was the remedy that fit this child. I've been treat giving that child that remedy for two years and he's done really beautifully. I just had uh, an appointment with his mom right now. And this is of course in homeopathic potency. So let me talk about the advantages of homeopathy. I'm gonna start with uh, the fourth one here, which is individualized to your child's needs. This is very different than going to a, uh, a child psychiatrist uh, and having your child uh, take Adderall, Ritalin, uh, a, a drug, a stimulant drug like that. Homeopathy is really tailored to your child, your child's symptoms, your child's personality, your child's needs. So that individualization is going to be completely different from what you get with conventional medicine. Homeopathy is not new and it may be new to you, but it's not new. It's been around for over 200 years. It's, uh, it's become much more sophisticated in that back then there were 45 main remedies called the polycrest, which were used most frequently. And now homeopaths uh, are trained in how to use many more remedies from the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, the mineral kingdoms primarily. And so the idea is to, to really treat your child as, uh, as a unique individual needing a unique remedy. You don't need to worry about side effects with homeopathy. Homeopathy, for one thing, is made from substances in nature rather than, uh, except on very rare occasions, drugs. There is such a thing as homeopathic Ritalin, for example, but I've never ever used that. So we're talking primarily about um, about substances from nature that are safe and natural. And the unusual aspect of homeopathy is we dilute our remedies. And so therefore, the even substances that if you, if you ingested that substance might potentially be toxic when prepared homeopathically is diluted many, many times, even hundreds or a thousand times. Okay, so you don't have to worry about safety and homeopathy. Homeopathy is safe even for pregnant moms, for infants, for pets, uh, for people who are, uh, who are quite ill, very safe. The medicine itself in homeopathy is very inexpensive. I don't think that any of my patients pays more than about $30 a month maybe a little bit more for the medicine. Uh, the cost of homeopathic care is the appointments with the homeopath rather than the medication. Homeopathy treats people, not diagnoses. I, I, would, I could never say that I treat ADHD, for example. I treat kids with unique symptoms such as uh, behavioral and learning problems but we treat the individuals, not the diagnosis. It's, it's beautiful that homeopathy doesn't just help with behavioral learning problems, but if your child happens to have headaches, if your child has eczema, which is very common, particularly among babies and younger children, usually resulting from allergies, if your child has stomach aches, constipation, the one homeopathic remedy that will help the ADHD will also help that. So we're talking about not needing to take either medications or supplements for each different symptom that your child might have. 
If you know anything about homeopathy, those of you who are watching now, you know that acute conditions, you can self-treat. And uh, our book, Homeopathic Self-Care, The Quick and Easy Guide for the Whole Family, I, I has sold 30,000 plus, I think it is, copies. Parents have raised their children on that book. So you can learn fairly easily to treat, uh, to treat minor burns, to treat first aid situations, colds, flus, sore throats, teething. So you need the help of a homeopath for something like, something chronic like behavioral learning problems. But uh, for those conditions, acute, you can have a kit and you can help your family yourself. We treat patients of all ages, a variety of different complaints, and, uh, and we listen um, very carefully to what's going on. And uh, I will a, a bit later include uh, COVID and particularly treating kids in during quarantine and kids who were uh, who were uh, in social isolation, et cetera, because that's been a big part of what I've been doing lately. Okay, I think we can move on. Rugrats on the run. So you will recognize if you have a child who is uh, is hyperactive, you will notice these classic symptoms restlessness. And when we're talking about restlessness, we see kids who tap, who jump, who run, you know, who cannot stop running, do somersaults, they climb. Uh, I had a kid the other day who was just uh, compelled to run as far and as fast as he could until he just exhausted himself. So there's a lot of, of, um, Hyperkinesis uh, is, the, is the term for this. In other words, a lot of kinetic motion. Poor eye contact. And this is particularly um, also with the kids on the autism spectrum. But with ADD, it's really kids are so distracted that they don't pay attention and may have poor eye contact because of that. Uh, sleeplessness isn't something I see so often, but sometimes the kids are just wired when they go to sleep as well. And fussiness. Fussiness in homeopathy, I practice what's called the sensation method of homeopathy. And that is by Dr. Rajan Sankaran. That's where I learned it. And how do you decide between 5,000 plus homeopathic remedies, one of the ways that we decide is whether someone needs an animal, a plant, or a mineral remedy. And this we'll talk about a little bit later. But fussiness, if it has something to do with sensory integration, in other words, the children are just overly sensitive to touch, to clothing, to just about anything, that often suggests a plant remedy. So you said <clears throat> even in the womb, you can um, tell if uh, the child could be um, ADHD. So how, how well, can you there there are there are moms because the first thing I do when I do a an appointment, a new appointment for a child, is I talk to the parent or parents, and I want the story from the very beginning, and that mother may have felt the kid being, being um, very restless, even in the womb, it can, it can go back to that. Or a mom might say, yeah, whenever I put on uh, loud music or whenever I put on um, music with a beat that I could feel the kicking. Yeah, I have heard that. Uh, okay. Um, okay. And while I'm mentioning the, the, history of the pregnancy and even pre-pregnancy, that's very important in homeopathy. And whenever I'm taking the case of a child, I always wanna find out what the story was during the pregnancy. And sometimes it's even helpful. Well, it's, it's often helpful to actually treat the parents as well, or at least the mom, because uh, the child can mimic 
one of its parents, uh, both in symptoms and you, I often find that um, with kids who are ADHD, their fathers in particular may have been really, um, really distractible or sometimes the moms too. And all that is really important information for me finding a remedy for the children. So what we're talking about, and I, uh, this will be very obvious to anybody who has a child like this, the need for constant stimulation. Now, in our age of everything electronic, which is far from healthy, this is even exacerbated. And so parents ask me, well, what do I do about my kids on devices? And uh, you may or may not be aware that many of the parents in Silicon Valley, Amita is probably well aware of this, and particularly, you know, those people who are, um, uh, you know, who have been around for a while and even in higher positions in these organizations, they often do not let their children use devices until a certain age. I was listening to an interview quite recently of someone who didn't let his child use devices. This, I think, was in the movie, The Social Dilemma, which I just saw. And I think he said it was until 14 years old. But there's a constant struggle between parents and kids and parents need to be very clear and set, set boundaries for all devices because video games and, um, and uh, being on social media, uh, et cetera, is just constantly uh, changing, stimulating, uh, et cetera. Reckless, impulsive, accident prone. Uh, and sometimes these kids have had injuries. Sometimes they've either been to the emergency rooms for, uh, for either falls where they needed stitches or concussions. I've seen this, head injuries in these children or just broken bones. So this is something which can, can, and we're talking even about toddlers here, tantrums. Well, kids who with uh, a violent type of ADHD, I have seen it all, I think. We're talking about parents whose walls are kicked in, whose doors are broken, who, I mean, we're not just talking about toys. We're talking about, um, I treated one child where, who was an adult. He, I'm sorry, he was um, about 17 and uh, he was also developmentally disabled. And he was just screaming the entire time that I took the case. These kids can be hard to put to bed. Uh, most of these kids, fortunately, are not cruel or malicious, but they can be. And there are certain remedies for kids who hurt animals, who, who really um, have very little, little sense of, um, of kindness, or they may have two sides. There's a homeopathic remedy, anacardium, where you see this really clearly, where you can have, they actually feel that there's a good and a bad side sitting on their, their, their shoulders, actually. And uh, it's, it's very hard for parents to, to be around this, but homeopathy can help. So by the time your child is three to five years old or even earlier, you may well have seen the symptoms of ADHD, uh, often earlier. There is a whole different aspect that surfaces in school but we're talking now about preschool, perhaps with, uh, with care providers at family events and uh, where relatives might say, or, or teachers might say to the parents, something is really off with your child. And now we're talking about COVID and my practice is virtual right now. And I am seeing more kids, I would say uh, almost than ever. Uh, on the hyperactive uh, spectrum because parents are at home, kids are at home 
And uh, although now some schools are opening up, so there is a mix, but uh, parents are beside themselves, they're frantic. And so uh, it's, I'm happy to say, uh, I'm able to help many of the kids uh, who are in the situation where they're climbing the walls, the parents are beside themselves and just trying to do their best to, uh, to work and to get their children's needs met as well. Uh, violence and destruction, I've already, managed, uh, already mentioned. Difficulty paying attention to follow directions is a big one. Even though these kids may not be hyperactive, they may have learning difficulties and learning is disabilities. And um, uh, I, this is uh, true regardless of the intelligence, regardless of the intelligence of the parents, the parents can, um, uh, can be uh, just uh, in disbelief that their kids have problems because they were such uh, great students. And uh, complaints from preschool teachers uh, are very common. That's one, although parents will have already seen at home these symptoms as well. At school, oh my gosh, all kinds of problems. And it's different when kids are schooled virtually, for example, during COVID, but uh, I talked to a parent the other day and, and she was saying, this was a very distractible child. She was saying, so the child looked at the screen, you know, when they're doing uh, virtual classrooms, this child was, and, and, um, and so there are different things sometimes on the screen, you know, including maybe the assignments. And she said, he just glazes over, you know, he looks at the screen, his eyes just shoot in all these different directions. And he, it's too much for him. He absolutely can't concentrate. So we're talking about grade suffering and uh, there can, the child can be sent to school when schools are happening with a backpack and uh, the backpack when the child comes home is in complete disarray, papers are missing. Uh, uh, it's just um, very scattered and uh, and very, very disorganized. Spacing out, spacing out, there are particular remedies for this as well. In other words, a child might be daydreaming, looking out a window, doodling, anything but uh, concentrating because that child just can't do it. And I, I really wanna mention, it's not that these children are doing this on purpose. And we live in a society that has really exacerbated all of this, okay? We live in a very fast paced society where things are moving more quickly all the time. And then you add um, the electronic devices. And uh, I was just talking to someone yesterday, it was very interesting. And he raised his kids with his wife, their mom in a very different way. And uh, they chose, believe it or not, to raise their kids. It was a type of homeschooling, but it was a very um, intentionally uh, uh, nonlinear homeschooling. And the children, they called it creativity based. And, uh, and sometimes in small pods with their neighbors. And he said they have two daughters. And he says that um, he has the most, the two most wonderful girls, that they are very, very well-rounded. And this was very different. I talked to another one of my, my parents this week and she is, has just started to homeschool her children, her two kids, and she was worried about it. And she said she received great reassurance from a woman that she contacted, an older woman, who homeschooled five children. And of those five children, one ended up going to Harvard, another ended up going to Yale. And that mother said, in her experience, children only really needed one to two hours a day 
a very, very structured uh, experience. So we have a lot to learn. Physically awkward and clumsy, um, that means kids who are, um, this is another type of child than what I've said so far, because some of these kids are very, uh, have a lot of dexterity, but some of the kids who are more backward are definitely awkward, clumsy, and um, bashful. That's a different, uh, those kids need different remedies. So there's a group called the Burritas uh, and also the Calcium Remedies, which fit these children better. Uh, defiance, I think I've already touched on, but we're talking about screaming, yelling, breaking things, refusing to take timeouts, all of that. Yeah, and again, this goes into, uh, you know, as, as the child gets older, we're talking about uh, problems with grades and uh, possibly drug and alcohol abuse uh, and I social isolation. I think, Amita, let's go look at some of the cases so people yeah. can. Sure, absolutely. Uh, All right, yeah. so let's move back. Okay. So here's a case, for example. And these are all real cases, we've disguised the names, but so this is a child who was quite annoying. And this is one of these kids who would talk, talk, talk. And uh, she was mischievous. That's why I called her Denise the Menace. And um, she was very strong-willed. In other words, when she was asked to do something that she didn't wanna do, she would throw a tantrum, she would slam a bedroom door, she would throw her toys across the room. She, I always talk to the children. I hear what they have to say. And uh, it's very important. Uh, often the, what the children have to say is the key to finding the remedy. Because we're talking about individualizing and tailoring the remedy to the child. So uh, she was a night owl. She had periodic headaches, which in homeopathy can be called school headaches. And uh, she loved um, pepperonis, which is smoked meat, pepperoni pizza, ice cream, et cetera. So I gave her a remedy called calcarea phosphorica, calcium phosphate, and it's a mineral remedy. So these kids are pretty organized. And it's a remedy for children who are often athletic. They may have knee pain, growing pains, very, very common. And uh, they can be really irritable. Uh, they often do not, um, they get really frustrated reading and doing math. And as I mentioned, they love smoked meat. So, what she needed was calcarea phosphorica, which is not an unusual homeopathic remedy. Let's see what happened. So the first follow-up with homeopathy is six weeks. By that six weeks, it's clear whether the remedy is going to work or not. And if it's going to work, it means it's the right homeopathic remedy. If not, that remedy needs to be changed. Most of the time I do see an improvement uh, with the first remedy. So at that five week point, usually at six, her parents said she was having a better time at school. Her anger and frustration were decreased. And at four months, her mom said, the terrible tantrums have not come back. We absolutely expect the physical symptoms to be better as well. So her knee and ankle pain were much improved. And she had more energy. She, in other words, what I mean by this is even though she uh, tantrums and everything, children who need calcium remedies can be a little slower. And sometimes they can tire after exertion. She received nine doses, and we're talking about single doses of the calcarea phosphorica over three and a half years. So what we're talking about is, is maybe three doses or so a year. So giving a dose, the dose would work and not given again until it stopped working. 
So I think that's pretty incredible. We're not talking about taking something every day in her case. And, uh, and then she didn't need any further treatment. Let's look at another case. Okay, so this is Dylan. And he had a family history of depression and bipolar disorder. And they had given him a number of medications, including lithium uh, for bipolar disorder, but uh, there were only temporary improvements. He was on Prozac by the time I saw him. He was very different from the child before, sensitive and compassionate, but the other side was combative, aggressive, and outrageous. He was very hot and uh, he, he uh, loved orange juice and olives. All of those things are important in finding the remedy. Let's see what, what I gave. So the most common homeopathic remedy is sulfur. And uh, we're talking about 5,000 remedies plus. This, this young man happened to need sulfur. And uh, there was a lack of motivation. He was argumentative, they're pretty self-centered and sloppy, often difficult to get them to um, comply with personal hygiene. And warm-blooded is a classic for sulfur. So he slept more than usual for the first two or three weeks after taking the, the remedy, which this can occur. His parents found he was much less combative, less confrontational, and more amiable. His grades improved. And he had talked about enemies before. Well, this didn't seem to be the case anymore. Uh, he was able to discontinue the Prozac and, um, and he did uh, really, really well. He needed six doses of sulfur over two and a half years. So what we're talking about, you give a homeopathic remedy, you do follow up in six weeks, the child is better, and I did not repeat the remedy again until uh, the effects wore off. So it's the same remedy you're saying um, for the, <clears throat> uh, you. so let me just back up a little bit. So at the time of six weeks, when you initially prescribe any remedy, then you will monitor around six weeks whether the same remedy has to continue or not, right? That's what I'm, I'm understanding. If, uh, if it'll be clear, um, much of the time, the parents will say, I really see a difference. That's great. So I know it's the right remedy, depends on how I've given it. If it's a single dose remedy, then I just wait until the child relapses. If I'm also giving a daily remedy, they continue the daily remedy. And six weeks is, uh, is quite uh, typical for, for a while, for the first two or three years, and then we can spread out the visits. Okay. okay. We have only two, two cases that I put over here. Um, and okay. then I, yeah. yeah. So let me just say that, um, I mean, I've seen thousands of cases. So uh, now with, um, and, and I also treat kids uh, on the autism spectrum as well. First, it started with ADD uh, and ADHD. And then there were so many kids who were being diagnosed on the spectrum. So it really depends on individualizing the symptoms. In general, I look at several different categories. When you're talking about um, children who are pretty structured, and uh, kids who, um, uh, who have pretty, they're concerned about their security, they're concerned about um, uh, friends and that type of thing. They often need mineral remedies such as the sulfur, such as the calcium phosphate, calcariophosphoric. A second category is plant remedies. And plants are highly sensitive. In other words, we're talking about the children who have sensory integration issues, the children who cannot stand to wear tight clothes. Or I took a new case the other this week. She had to have clothes that were tight. She couldn't stand it otherwise. 
And these children often have their feelings hurt easily. They can be really sensitive to having their hair brushed or their nails clipped. And, uh, and they can be very pain sensitive as well. And a classic example of this is chamomile, chamomilla. And anyone who knows that homeopathic remedy, it's a big remedy for teething, for ear pain. And these kids are screaming with pain. And classically, it's the baby who wants to be carried all the time. You can't even put the baby down. That's chamomilla. And then there's animals. There's the whole category of animal remedies. And um, uh, there's a classic case that we have in, in one of our books. It might be Rage Free Kids of a child who, uh, and this was not a child. This was a uh, uh, a young man about 10 when I first saw him, 10 or 11. And uh, he had terrible temper tantrums. He, he would hit people and he would be combative with his parents. And uh, the very first um, noise or sound that the baby made when it came out of the womb, and I only found this out after I decided to give lion's milk, the mother said he roared. That was the very first sound to come out of his mouth. And he never knew what remedy I gave him. And he would say things spontaneously, like I'm at the top of the food chain or I'm nursing my wounds. In other words, he needed this remedy, lion's milk. And each time he took it, he got better. And that's how he could actually come out of the womb roaring, which is pretty incredible. So what I'm trying to say is that's not something that you would be able to treat yourself. There is a lot of homeopathic remedies that can be used for acute conditions that you can learn how to treat yourself, but not the kind of conditions that we're talking about. Okay, so here's some questions for you to ask, and then I can open this up to questions from you. So ask yourself, can homeopathy help my child or even you with ADHD? In my experience uh, over treating these kids for you know, well over 20, 25 years, I've been in practice for 36 years. It's just that the, the epidemic didn't really start uh, as soon as I started my practice. So most children in my experience can potentially benefit from homeopathic treatment with these problems. And what do I mean by benefit? Their symptoms should be a good 70% better or more for me to feel like I found the right homeopathic remedy. You want somebody who is really experienced in treating children with this type of condition, okay? Who, uh, you don't want somebody who's just starting out who doesn't have uh, the array of cases to compare one to another. So my child psychiatrist says his problems are caused by a biochemical imbalance. Can homeopathy help? Absolutely, homeopathy can help. Homeopathy is individualized. We're trying to, to find that one remedy for the whole person. Uh, a question, Amita, if I think if you scroll a little bit more through these questions, yeah. So uh, a really common question uh, that I used to have asked is um, my kid's on medication already. Can, can he or she still be treated? Yes. Fortunately, I, I think parents are more educated. Hopefully they know a little bit more about homeopathy. By far, most of the kids that I'm seeing now have not yet been put on medication, which is really wonderful. How long will I continue homeopathic treatment? Uh, I am just the doctor for many of these kids. I'm not talking about primary care practitioner. They uh, will have a local doctor. A lot of my patients I treat uh, virtually. Now they're all virtually, but I have patients all over the world. And so um, how long? Uh, as long as the parents want. But um, since homeopathy treats the whole person, I have parents who they feel like their kids have gotten a lot better. They've stopped homeopathic treatment. And then 
uh, now that the kids are uh, may have graduated from college or on their own, some of those parents send those kids back to me for more of um, adult kinds of issues. And it's, it's very gratifying. Does my child have to stop taking medication? No. In fact, I treat uh, patients with bipolar disorder. I treat patients with uh, a variety of different conditions. And sometimes they are on medications. This is true with schizophrenia as well. And some of those patients continue along with homeopathy to take their conventional medication. And some of my longest patients with bipolar disorder, we're talking about uh, 10, 15, 20 years or more, that's the case. So uh, it's whatever is in the best interest of the person. Okay. So um, anything more before we open up for questions? No, I think I'm happy to do questions. Okay, we have a question coming up. Before that, you're welcome to reach us. Uh, I forgot to put our email here, but um, it's care at nourishdoc.com. If, if you can't think of any question now, if you want to reach us after the session, you're welcome to do that. So I'm going to stop share and there's a question that's coming up. And please uh, put your questions in the chat window. All right, so someone is saying, um, do you do any blood work to monitor the extra calcium, phosphorus, or sulfur that you are giving is not harmful for them? So I, I really encourage you to take a look at some of our books on homeopathy or the website. I have a ton of articles on the website to really understand the difference between homeopathy. We're talking about in a case where I'm giving calcium phosphate, we're talking about a, a, a substance, a remedy, which has been diluted maybe a thousand times. So okay. there, is no, there is no worry whatsoever in a case like that of, um, uh, of needing to chelate out any calcium or... Uh, so no, we're talking about very, very gentle, non-harmful medication. So these are already diluted. homeopathic medicines are diluted a lot, right? Well, I mean, that's what. Yeah. So the very least we're talking about is uh, one part of the original substance to, to it, the way I prescribe, I prescribe uh, centesimal remedies, one part of the mm -hmm. original remedy to 99 parts water or with a bit of alcohol in it. Okay. Now, and that is just a 1C. And what I'm presenting in these cases, that's been done 200 times. That's been done a thousand times, 10,000 times. So no, there's nothing of the original substance uh, really left, left in it that can be measurable. So, um, so, so the main, um, did we answer this question? If you have any follow-up, uh, let us know. Um, okay, I'm just looking at, uh, are these therapies approved? Well, what exactly? I think homeopathy, is that what you mean by the question when you said, are these therapies approved? That's what I'm assuming that the question is on that. Um, so homeopathy is legal in this country, right? It is approved. Yeah, homeopathy is legal. I mean, uh, there's two ways to, to, uh, to work with homeopathy. One, home, one way is, to buy uh, something over the counter and treat yourself for first yeah. aid or acute conditions. These are FDA approved medicines, remedies. The other, if you go to, um, to a practitioner, that practitioner will at the very least be certified or will be a doctor like myself. And uh, so I have um, four years of naturopathic medical school, plus I'm board certified in homeopathy. Plus I have a master's in psychiatric social work. But what's most important if you're going to a homeopath is go to somebody who has been very well trained in homeopathy and has a lot of experience. Okay. Um, any other follow-up on that question before I move on? Okay. So someone is asking, where do you source your ingredients from? Is there a cost? I think there might be a homeopathic doctor who's asking this question. I don't know if you, who you are. Uh, well, there are, 
I have two homeopathic pharmacies that I use. One is in California, one is in the UK, but um, there's, uh, it's changed during the pandemic because at the beginning of the pandemic, fortunately, I have a really large pharmacy. I've been in practice for so long, but it was very difficult. The homeopathic pharmacies were weeks out and um, our kits sold out basically permanently. And so it was very difficult for a while for the homeopathic pharmacies worldwide to, um, uh, to meet the demand, but that's now changed. And um, I may have my own personal preferences, but there are a lot of good homeopathic pharmacies and you can get homeopathic remedies over the counter as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've actually seen it uh, when you walk into Sprouts and Whole Foods and they have yeah. some of the basic homeopathic medicines out there that anyone can buy on the, you know, over yes. the counter. Yeah. Definitely. yeah, yeah. Okay, so then somebody is asking, is it only for kids to 12 years old? Uh, I think you mean by the ADHD, is that what you mean? Um, can you specify or expand on the question that you're asking? Um, I'm assuming that that's what you're asking, yes. Okay, so they're saying for ADHD, is it only for kids to 12 years old? Oh or? my gosh, no. I mean, we're talking about, you know, treating for the age. We're talking about, uh, uh, for one thing, so you yeah. can start treating during pregnancy. You can start, um, my husband treated his mom till the pretty much uh, minutes before she died. In other words, uh, and we're talking about animals. We're talking about, there's, uh, there are people who do agricultural homeopathy. They do homeopathy for, uh, you know, for trees, for crops. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, it's, I, it's really, about the homeopathy for the, for, for the pets as well, right? For, for oh dogs. my gosh, you know, we've, we've, had, um, we've had golden retrievers for 36 years and uh, 40 years. And uh, we always, always treat our pets with homeopathy. I have, there were, we had one dog, we had one golden retriever who uh, she, we had her for about three months and then we went to Hawaii for two weeks. We took her back to the breeder and they overfed her and you cannot overfeed really early. And so it's six months yeah. because of that, she was diagnosed with hip dysplasia. We treated her ironically with calcar calcarea phosphorica, just what I mentioned for the hip dysplasia. She lived till, um, I think she, she was one of the ones who left early, but she left, she lived till um, uh, 11 and all she had was a sway in her hip. She never ever had consequences from the hip dysplasia. And that was from cal calcium phosph phos calcarea phosphoricum, calcium phosphate. Okay, so there's a question that's coming up. Um, what is the success rate of homeopathy? Do they always work? <laughs> no, <laughs> they, don't, they don't always work. It would be wonderful if it always worked. You have a much greater chance of success if you go to somebody who has been doing it for a long time. So for me, I'm pretty demanding. In other words, when we're talking about ADHD, I want uh, at least a 70% improvement in symptoms across the board. My gosh, what percentage will be bet that much better the first time? In my practice, oh gosh, at, 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 least, at least 50%, hopefully quite a bit more. Most of the time I get the right remedy the first time, but certainly not all the time. Um, and uh, so I would say that's the success rate. It's, I would say it's, it's very high. And I don't know if we're talking about ADHD, but um, I would say that with ADHD as well. well. So how much would you say 60 to 70%, uh, something like that? Well, what we're talking, there's two things with success. One is the percentage better, and the other is the percentage of the kids who respond. Correct. I am not satisfied unless there's at least a 70% improvement. I'm still looking for a different remedy. Yeah. And yeah. I would say uh, with the right remedy, almost all the kids would respond. And uh, I would say, what can I say? I'd say at least 80% of the kids. That's very high. 
that I yeah. can find the right remedy for those kids. That's very hard to say. And the parents need to stick with it because it might be I find the remedy right off. And with any homeopath, it might it might take longer. But that's why you want to go to somebody experienced because they have a better yeah. chance. Okay. So one of the questions that's coming up, uh, you know, it's, homeopathy is mainstream in Germany and Europe, in India, you know, I grew up in India. Uh, I myself have, you know, I've taken homeopathy remedy, you know, for simple things. So how come it's not mainstream in this country? That's one of the questions also coming up, but I wanted to give a little bit of a context as well. You know, I mean, Europe, it's mainstream. India, it's mainstream and a lot of other countries, I'm sure. But how come in the United States? It's a very big question, but maybe you could. Um... Homeopathy almost died. Homeopathy was practiced at the turn of the century, 1900, by one out of every five or six MDs at that point. There was a political, there, there was a political uh, event uh, called the Flexner Report uh, by the Carnegie Foundation. And it, downgraded uh, homeopathic schools because of the lack of research um, uh, facilities in those schools. Homeopathy nearly died out. There were only, there were handfuls of homeopaths here and there that kept going. There was a resurgence of homeopathy in the seventies. And this was right at the time I got into homeopathy and a number of people did. There was a resurgence and it's gotten more and more popular in the past uh, 10 years in particular, homeopathy is really under threat in or around the world. Um, there are a lot of, there's a, a movie called um, uh, Homeopathy, the Magic Pill, uh, there's, which is, um, uh, you can check that out right now. Now, um, homeopathy in Europe uh, has been really um, under threat as well. For example, in Spain, they removed homeopathy from the curricula, both of the medical and veterinary school uh, curriculum. There used to be a wonderful homeopathic hospital in Glasgow. I could go on and on. And um, the number of people practicing homeopathy and the, particularly the training has decreased worldwide, except for in India. And we're talking about uh, even, uh, even in Germany, uh, India is the, the biggest hope so far uh, of homeopathy continuing to spread. There are something like, I've lost track, but 120 homeopathic medical colleges in India. And uh, they'll never get rid of homeopathy in India. You know, it's in the in the blood, plus it's very inexpensive medicine. So um, I, I must say that the FDA has, uh, has been, um, I wanna be careful of the words that I use, but the FDA has said that they may uh, really remove homeopathic remedies from, uh, from availability in the US indirectly because this would be by making the, the studies necessary to approve each medicine individually so expensive that, uh, that it's prohibitive. We, uh, there, this has been going on now for about two years and um, maybe Amita, maybe you can, you can give a link and I can provide a link for you. Uh, people are still being asked to give feedback in this country right now. It's a very, very important period to support homeopathy in this country. So is it because of lack of research? Main, main reason is that? Or what, because, uh, because yeah, why, do I, why, why do I think it is? Yeah, <laughs> I, why is I, it I, being downgraded? Or I mean, we are going to take you off the subject here. I'm sorry, um, I didn't no, mean to. No, it's not off the subject because of it's, it's competitive to, uh, to the interests of uh, yeah, absolutely. a big pharma. That's that's why it's happening. I don't want to get too political here, but yeah, you know, homeopathy is um, even though it's a very small piece of the pie, it's a piece of the pie. And mm -hmm. uh, to me, it would just be tragic if homeopathic remedies were 
were taken off the, the shelves here. But something similar happened in Europe. It was called the Codex. And they were trying to make this happen with herbs so that each herb had to be studied individually and it was gonna be so expensive. Mm -hmm. And here it was for the same reason. And so that's what they're talking about doing here. There has been um, a lot of very, very positive uh, dialogue between mm -hmm. the homeopathic pharmacists, the FDA, homeopathic patients, homeopaths. And we are hoping and praying that that bears fruit. Okay. Any more questions? I, I know we went a little bit um, off the off the you know ADHD topic. Any more comments or um, feedback from from people who are in Zoom? Okay. Um, all right. If there are no more comments, uh, let us know feedback on the session. You know we bring these educational sessions every week. Tomorrow we have another session on actually ADHD again um, on um, a naturopathic uh, doctor. She's going to uh, narrate a case study and also on uh, autism. Uh, I'm just saying that you know we have that. Okay, so oh, there's another question. This is a, what is the thirty dollars you talked about earlier? I think you talked yeah. about the medication, right? Somebody asked me what the medications cost, and what I yeah. said is the way I practice, probably thirty dollars. Uh, about $30 a month maximum, but that's not talking about the cost of homeopathic care. The, sure. the cost of homeopathic care, I estimate, uh, and my fees are, are not much different from, um, from other people with my training, it's about $1,500 the first year, and then uh, less, you know, in progressive years, but uh, it, it's a real bargain, really. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'd be happy, you know, I treat people um, really all over the world and I'm definitely taking new patients. And I'm, there's a lot of interest right now in, uh, in webinars. My gosh, I'm doing a webinar mm -hmm. for the National Center for Homeopathy on um, kids and COVID. For example, you know, kids during coping parents, uh, saving sanity of parents and kids during COVID and that's in um, December. And um, I'm speaking at the, if there is a conference of the National Center for Homeopathy, uh, I'm supposed to speak in Baltimore next April. So there is just a huge interest in homeopathy internationally right now. I'm so happy. That's, that's great, that's great. All right, with that, we, we are at the hour. Uh, we'd like to wrap up this session. Thank you so much, uh, all of you, for joining us. Let us know your feedback on the sessions and what are the topics you'd like to see. We are always uh, bringing new topics. The underlying thing is we always present success cases so that people have the, you know, we, we present the evidence, whoever we bring. With that, have a great weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Judith. Thank you, Anita. Bye-bye.